It's five past three, which as a teacher makes it period eight on a Friday afternoon. So I would like to thank you for being the first room I've ever stood at the front of, period eight Friday, and you might actually show, show some interest in what I'm about to say. So thank you very much. I am gonna to talk today about engagement. And what I'd like to do straight away is just think about well, what do you mean when you say engagement? And I thought about this just as I was having coffee about five minutes before coming on, and I thought, hang on, you guys are a pretty select bunch of people. So I want you to flip, change that to what do you think your colleagues think of engagement? Because what I think um, when I think of what my colleagues think, or some of my colleagues think of engagement, is I think they think, well, if the kid's done the homework, if the kid's done their assessment task, if the kid put their hand up, don't speak in class, where's their uniform, takes part in debating, cricket, rugby, football, then they're engaged. I think we mistake conformity for engagement far too often. I think we see kids doing what they're expected to do and we say that they're engaged. On the flip side, I think when kids don't do what they do, automatically we go, oh, they are naughty children, aren't they? They are so disengaged. Look at him. Look, he doesn't even wear a tie. So what I want to do today is just to put across some ideas. And basically, I've done a bit of reading, and I've taken the ideas which are well established in behavioral psychology, and I've just added a couple of uh, my ideas to it. And the, the, look, to be honest with you, you've heard from a lot of experts today. And for the next 20 minutes, I want you to be the experts. So I hope you don't want your money back, but I want you to be the experts. I'm just a bloke with some ideas. I don't mind whether you think they're good, whether you think they're bad, so long as you think about them. Okay? So the first thing I want to talk about is the definition of engage. Now this is the Macquarie Dictionary definition, and it says to occupy the attention or, or efforts of a person. If we use that definition, I would say the majority of schools and parents do a marvellous job of engaging their students. You know, there's a new phenomenon, the hurried child. The child who literally leaves school, goes to tutoring, goes to football, comes home, has to do their homework, you know, does the chores around the house, then goes to bed, then gets up and does it all over again. In fact, we reward those kids that account for every microsecond of their time by praising them in their reports. And we're concerned when some kids aren't involved in debating or aren't playing sport, often without any regard for what they are actually doing, whether it's in school or outside of school. There's a second definition of engage in the Macquarie Dictionary, which I love, and in hindsight, I should have put it up here, and it is to attract and hold the attention of. It really got me thinking, like, do we genuinely attract and hold the attention of our kids, or do we just push them into learning? and try and hold them there by locking the doors and windows. <laughs> Seriously, I worked in a school in Manchester, we had to lock the doors and windows. Um, but the, this is the definition of engagement I'd like us to consider today. L the sense of living a life high on interest, curiosity and absorption. Engaged individuals pursue goals with determination and vitality. When you write engaged in your reports, probably the end of this semester, is, is that what your kid, are, are those the kids you're describing? So that's, the, that's the, the premise of what I mean by engagement. And basically, I frame my work on the work of Ryan and Decky, who basically in 1999 came up with the self-determination theory. And it's written beautifully in the book there, which has just gone off the page. That's not Daniel Hasler, unfortunately. That's Daniel H. Pink. Now, I'm sure some of you would have read the, this book. If you haven't, I implore you to go and read it. It's a fantastic book. Um, it's called Drive by Daniel Pink. And he writes beautifully about self-determination theory. What he says is for people to be, anyone to be genuinely engaged, they require three factors. They need a sense of autonomy, which is a sense of you know, what they do, when they do it, who they do it with, how they do it. They need a sense of mastery, which is this notion of getting better for the sake of getting better, regardless of how good they are. And the third factor, he says, that we need is a sense of purpose. Why are we doing this, sir? 
Now, I've not told Ryan and Decky this yet, but I reckon they missed one out. So I stuck it right in the middle. And that emblem is supposed to signify relationships. Because I reckon that kids engage with people long before they engage with subjects. In fact, many people who are good at certain subjects are turned completely off them by their teacher. <laughs> so what I want to, want to think about right in the middle of that is what are the things that we do that have a direct impact on students' intrinsic motivation and their engagement. Because too often we just go, oh, well, it's down to them to look, you know, they've got to want it. Fair enough, you're right, they do have to want it. But how, how can our organizations, how can our schools, how can our classrooms actually enhance these three factors? And this is what I spend a great deal of my time talking about when I'm in schools, when I'm working with uh, organizations employing young people, Gen Y. Um, you know, Gen Y need this, okay? Our kids at school right now in period eight need this. So this sense of autonomy, first of all, I just want to, I'm going to go through fairly quickly uh, each of these. The sense of autonomy, who, what, how, when, where. Technology has made this so easy to do, okay? We just need to embrace it and think critically about how we can do it as parents and as teachers. I don't think education only takes place in school. Okay, it takes place everywhere in the community and we need to think how we can pr create more autonomous kids. The sense of mastery, I love using Roger Federer as my example here. Roger Federer is the finest tennis player I have ever seen. Now it's pointless arguing with me because for all you know, he's the only tennis player I've seen. <laughs> But to be perfectly frank, he's won more Grand Slam titles than anyone. He's spent more consecutive weeks at number one than anyone else. He was voted sports personality across all sports four times, four consecutive years, which is a record for the Sports Laureus Personality of the Year. In a couple of years ago, he was voted by 50,000 people across 125 countries the second most trustworthy and respected human on earth <laughs> after Nelson Mandela. Now, if anyone is entitled to wake up in the morning and think, you know what, I think I've pretty much got my life sorted, <laughs> it's Rog. But only about four weeks ago, he got to the Madrid Masters. I'm a sports nut. You guys may or may not remember. It was a tennis tournament played on controversial blue clay. And Nadal and Djokovic, they spat their dummies out when they lost on the blue clay uh, and said, I'm never playing here again. <laughs> It reminded me of my, my kids, <laughs> you know, oh, it doesn't, something went wrong, it's not my fault. Um, the clay was dodgy. We're not playing at the Madrid Masters again until it's uh, sorted out. Roger Federer won the tournament. He said, I got here in the first couple, of week, uh, first couple of days and I saw this blue clay and I thought I have to get better on clay. Roger Federer thought he had to get better. Okay, thank you. Noted. Um, <laughs> Never saw a play. Best, the most Grand Slams of a tennis player I've ever seen. <laughs> um, purpose. Um, purpose has got to, We've got to have more of it. More uh, of a sense of doing. Um, you know, rather than just for grades. Rather because it's something you're going to need when you're older. You know, it's got to be um, relevant. It's got to be making some kind of difference. And I wanted to use an example of this to talk about Coney. Now, I'm assuming you know Coney. Probably not personally, but you probably know who Joseph Coney is. Now, I first heard about Coney on my um, students, uh, we've got a, a pastoral group, and our students' Facebook page. Yes, we have Facebook. And we've only had zero instances of inappropriate use, because, again, it's all about the cultures we create for them. And I'm still waiting for Tracy Grimshaw to get in contact with me about a shocking story of teenagers using social media appropriately, but I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still waiting for that call. Anyway. <laughs> Coney, the whole Coney project basically provoked millions of teenagers to do something. Now, granted, it was only a small thing, but how many teachers or parents would love to have their teenagers do anything? But what did the old people do? Oh no, what are you doing? You can't talk about this. You don't even know where Uganda is. Stop it. What are you doing taking part in this discussion? 
You've got no right to talk about things you don't understand. You've got no right to act on things you don't understand. I personally believe that the best way to engage kids and get them to understand is to discuss it and to act. Because that engages them, that gives them a purpose. So I had a Facebook project, my year 11 girls wanted to learn about body image, so they decided to do a health promoting Facebook page for body image. 56 likes they had after two days. There's no grade I could give them that would match the pride that they felt when they saw 56 people like their page. There is no mark I could give them when they saw that a blogger had included a link to their Facebook page on her um, nutrition website. There is, no uh, there is no mark I could give that would give the, the students the same sense of pride as when a parent, and I know you can read but I'll read it out for you, said, thank you for this, I have a six-year-old daughter who is already anxious about her appearance and I've talked with her a bit but it's not getting through. I'll check out the items at the end of this video. That, ladies and gentlemen, is purpose. And by the way, there's Uganda, for those of you who weren't sure. <laughs> now then, the sense of engagement has a direct impact on well-being. If the kids are engaged, they feel good about themselves. And as by way of a, an illustration, I want to read a poem to you that was written by a, a nine-year-old boy. Just to give you a backstory, this, this nine-year-old boy was one of the kids, ADHD, never attended school, had poor relationships with students and teachers. One day, he got up and he read this poem out. It's called I Am by Clint, age nine. I'm a simple boy who likes turtles. I wonder what the world will be like in 2020. I hear many sad tears. I see people losing their families. I want peace in the world. I'm a simple boy who likes turtles. I pretend to stop a war. I feel as if something stabbed me. I touch the ends of the earth. I worry about the sea and the land. I cry about the death of people. I'm a simple boy who likes turtles. I understand there are some things that people can't do. I say people should believe more in each other. I dream about the things I see. I try to do better in everything. I hope war will end, but I'm just a simple boy who likes turtles by Clint, age nine. Now I've read that poem probably seven or eight times now across Australia, and every single time I read it, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Every single time I read it, there's a silence at the end of it. And on, never has anyone put their hand up and said, that's not very good, is it? <laughs> but his teacher did this. Because the problem was that Clint, that disengaged ADHD, ADHD boy who doesn't get on with pa uh, the teachers, his parents or kids, was supposed to write about what it's like to be a turtle. So just as getting engagement right enhances our kids' well-being, when we get it so wrong, it can have a really bad impact on our kids' well-being. And studies show that those, pe those kids who are, do feel good about themselves, who are flourishing in positive psychology terms, they're more likely to have a growth mindset similar to that of Federer. They're more likely to approach mastery approach goals, to get better regardless of how good they are, for the sake of getting better at it. Not because it's going to give them an A or a B, because they want to get better. And they're more likely to report high grades, which I put there just to keep the principals and everyone else happy, you know, and the, the government, you know, try and keep them happy as well. Because it's important that our kids feel good about themselves, and apparently we need to justify that. And I talk about this as being a, a virtuous cycle, but I was listening to Barbara Fredrickson in a workshop on Wednesday. She had a wonderful term where she was talking about an upward spiral. And I might nick that offer because I really like that, that idea of as kids engage, they feel good, they achieve, they engage deeper, they, get, they engage more, they feel better about themselves, they achieve more. So it's not really a cycle, it doesn't just stay in the same spot, it actually lifts the kids up. So I might nick that from uh, Dr. Fredrickson. <laughs> I'll tell her, of course. Um, so what can we do to encourage a, a culture of genuine engagement? Well, one of my pet things at the moment is grading. The Board of Studies in New South Wales, I'm not sure where everyone's from, but from New South Wales it says we have to report to parents via a grade twice a year. Not twice a day. You know? So let's grade less. 
Let's give really good feedback instead. You know, how, how, can we, how can we get better? How can we move you forward? How could you have done that differently? Are there any alternatives here? We need to ask why. Why are we doing this? And if the only reason that we're doing it is because it's going to be on the exam, we need, a be we need better content. We need better curriculum. And we have to do that. Parents have to say, look, I'm sending my kids to school because I think it's for the best. Teachers, you know, we, we are the professionals. We have to stand up for our profession. So I'm not, I'm not going to go through all those things because I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys can read. And, and things will be more applicable or less applicable depending on your organization, depending on the kids you work with, depending on your parent body, depending on the, your, your colleagues. So this is what I uh, want to come back to is that you are the experts. Believe that and act like that on Monday and say, you know what, what we're doing there, maybe we could do it a bit differently. Maybe these kids aren't as disengaged as perhaps they could, be, uh, as perhaps they, you know, we think they are. And I think the most important thing we can do is talk more. Because no one in this room is smarter than everyone in this room. Is as smart as everyone in the broader community. We really need to break down these silos of education, mental health, and we are doing it, by, by the way. I think, you know, Reach Out and Beyond Blue and Black Dog, they're doing fantastic things. We've got groups out in the um, hallway now. There is um, a group called Kids Giving Back. I urge you to go and uh, speak to them. They can provide you a whole load of resources to, to give you projects to base your learning around with real purpose. The top link there is still trying to find X. It is a free manifesto that I have written. It's available there. It's available on my website. I would love you to download it, share it, collaborate on it, give your, put your ideas into it. Obviously, I've got my website. I've got email, Twitter, and Facebook. It is now just about going home time for my kids. Thank you very much for not running out. Thank you very much for listening. Enjoyed it.